I am a perfectionist. I've always drawn, just because of the wording on my website and how I present myself, maybe, I don't know, but I've always drawn perfectionists. And perfectionists are often high achieving, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're always, the, I love the servant's heart of I will leave this place better. The problem with perfectionism is, well, the benefit of perfectionism is it can be better. I know it can be better. I can mm -hmm. be better. It can be better. Mm -hmm. You can be better. We can all be better. Yay. <laughs> like that's the beauty of perfectionism. Mm -hmm. The downside is that if we are not already there, we beat ourselves up. Mm. I know this is how I should be, right? but I'm not. And then so we're unkind to ourselves because we aren't at our goal yet. Do you struggle with perfectionism, procrastination, or self-acceptance? Then stick around because in this episode of the Mental Health Toolbox, we are talking with Dr. Jane Tornator, author of Everything is Perfect, Just Not Me, a roadmap to self-acceptance. So let's go. Dr. Jane Tornator is a brain geek and self-compassion expert based in Seattle, Washington. As a psychotherapist, coach, speaker, and author, she works with intelligent, motivated, high-achieving women who are committed to being better people, yet never feel better enough. Women who want to finally like themselves and stop second-guessing their decisions. So let's meet Jane. You can learn more about Jane's work by going to her site, drcornertort.com or everydaylove.me. Hello, Dr. Tornator. Thank you so much for making time to be on the Mental Health Toolbox today. Really appreciate you making time to, sh to share your nuggets of wisdom and uh, help our audience. So thank you so much. I am delighted and I'm so looking forward to our conversation today. Me as well. Me as well. Excellent. So you are not just a therapist, you're an LMFT and a doctor of psychology, and you have a book out now. So author and you're a speaker. So a lot of things we could dive into um, before we go down any rabbit trails. Maybe you could share with an, our audience a little bit about your background and how you got into this work. Uh, well, I love those questions and something different comes out every single time. Right. <laughs> right? But first I want to I want to comment on something that just struck me. So I was listening to one of your uh, previous podcasts with the woman who was just like in my mind insanely productive and mm -hmm. she had fibromyalgia and I'm like, and she does this and she does this. Yes. Holy cow. How does she do it? And then you <laughs> listed my list and I'm like, wow, yeah. how did you do all that? I'm like, wait, that's me. <laughs> yes, right. I think we have a hard time giving ourselves credit, right? Or credits do. Exactly. exactly. So it's helpful to have that external reflection sometimes for us to go, Oh, maybe I am enough. So that said, my whole journey, like I started, I started out as an English grad because I loved an English literature major because I loved reading stories and getting in people's lives and seeing what motivated them. It thrilled me. But when I graduated, like academia was dead, basically. Mm -hmm. So I went into work in advertising, which I hated. But then we went into a family, my sister dragged us into a family therapist and the woman started with this speech. She said, my job is to put myself out of business. Mm. Now, I'm New York City, you know, big eight advertising firm. And I'm like, that is insane. What's she <laughs> going to do to help me here, right? Right. But she said, the more people, the more families I help, they become healthier. And then if they go on to get, the kids go on to get partners and kids, those families are healthier. And then if they go on to have partners and kids and they have families, they'll be healthier. She said, it'll spread around the world and I'll be out of a job. And I went, I like that idea. I love it. Absolutely. Oh, wasn't it right? brilliant? Yes. So I quit advertising and uh, before they fired me, because I was really awful at it and went to grad school. And then I was going to go into academia and be a therapist. But honestly, academia is just like being a grad student. Hmm. Perpetually, right? <laughs> yeah, perpetual, <laughs> constant work, like no downtime. There's always, always something to be done, especially in academia. So anyway, I'm like, that's not how I want to live. Um, and so I went to work on some research studies. But 
and I was a, a project director, statistical analysis, all that fun stuff. And it was mm -hmm. fun. But once again, I didn't wake up and go, oh, I'm changing the world. This is awesome. I was contributing knowledge, which is awesome. But I didn't wake up enthused. So one grant ended and I went, now's the time. If any time is now, if there's any time, it's now. And so I dove in and developed my own private practice. And Patrick, I never wanted to work for myself. I, I like the security and the safety of the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That somebody else is giving to me. Now I can't imagine anything else. That's wonderful. For all of the, th the therapists out there scared to make the leap, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. the way I did it was, because I do like security, I would get like part-time jobs as I was building my practice. And then when my practice was full, I finally quit all my part-time jobs, you know, letting go a job at a time. Mm -hmm. and then I decided I couldn't see, like my system cannot see as many people as insurance. Right. Because of it, right. So um, I thought I'm going to go private practice, private pay, private mm -hmm. practice. And so I, as I brought on a new private pay person, I would let go or as mm -hmm. people from insurance would leave, I wouldn't bring on a new insurance people. And it's complicated. I, unless you've been yeah. through the, the motions, I, I think most therapists branching out to private practice would assume, oh, I can just take, I can just get credentialed with every insurance under the sun and I'll be fine. But like you said, insurance will only compensate about 75 a session. Yeah. And then, you. you know, in order, and, you know, you'd still have to see eight to 10 clients a day yeah. to make what you were making in agency work, right? Yeah. Um, to even probably not even that if you minus the benefits. Right. Right. And then no, once you're on an insurance own, panel, yeah. right, it takes a year to get off. I think something like that. Right. Because you're a on year a year to get off to get off. Sometimes it a lot of insurance companies won't cut you loose for a year. Really? Um, if you're on contract. Wow. Yeah. So like if you're seeing a client, you have to continue to take their insurance and for some some length of time, oftentimes in the contract. So even like bridging entirely to private pay is a process once you're tied in. It absolutely is. And I did it in a, um, I would just, I, once I was seeing a client with insurance, I would just see them until um, they were done. Mm -hmm. And so it was, your, it was a, it was a multiple year process. I think once I decided to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it's what a totally journey. Doable. Huh? We could talk it's for an hour scary. just about that. What? <laughs> so we could talk for an hour just about that, you know, the yes, journey right. of private yeah. practice, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That sucks. Exciting. Exciting. So how, how long did it take you to kind of go from the agency work to full-blown private practice? It took me 10 years from when I started my private practice to full private pay. Hmm. I'm always, I've always been a slow mover. Like it took me 10 years to get through grad school because I have ADHD and dyslexia, right? Yeah. So, so there's some uh, wisdom in that though. <laughs> yeah, right. It was, but it was also good for my nervous system mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm single. So I don't have a partner who can, you know, fill in if I have a bad month, they can you right. know, fill in. So for me, it was that. So plus, honestly, I really was bad at marketing. I, I, I just would not market. So I was just kind of magical thinking of, so just come in if I mm -hmm. have a website up. Build it and they will come, right? Right. But that's where the speaking comes in. I would speak at a lot of things and that's where people would see me and go, oh, yeah, I want to I want to work with her. So it was the speaking really that. Like, see, that's uh, a whole other topic, too, we could we could address. Right. There's a book on that called Stages, if I'm not if I'm correct. Like it's a it's a big deal getting on stages and something that's often overlooked when yeah. it comes to growing a business. It is. So. And to figure out how to market. This is what I did not learn for years how to market, not market yourself, but speak in a way that says, hey, I'm a, I'm a therapist and I'd be awesome for you kind of thing. I I'm come from education, so I would just educate. And then people would say, why didn't you like say that you're a therapist? I'm like, uh, well, I did, but I didn't speak from that angle at all. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> right, right. You weren't fishing for referrals per se. Yeah, but the point yeah. is you can be really bad at marketing and still become a private pay Full therapist, right? So, so. <laughs> Absolutely. And it sounds like you have a servant's heart, right? 
yeah. serve first. There's actually a book on that too. Serve first, and then and then they will come. Right when when you actually when you provide value. Right. Yeah, and I think all therapists have a servant's heart. Yeah. But that's why we're that's why we're in this business. It's a yeah. hard Amen. job, yeah. <laughs> right? But we are you committed have to. to making yeah. the world better. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's leave, leave this place better than we found it. Right? Ideally. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. What a great yeah. idea. Yeah. Right. <laughs> My, my kids are in Girl Scouts, so that's like a motto. Like, <laughs> leave it better than you found it. Like, yeah, it's kind of what therapists try to do, right? It a little bit, of, a little is. bit of good. Yeah, absolutely is, and it ends up being a lot of good. It's amazing. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Excellent. So, private practice, full pay, speaker, which helped be a catalyst. It sounds like to the the full pay client caseload, right? Yes. Yeah. And then at what point did you say, hey, I'm going to target high power, productive, motivated women specifically? How did you niche it? Did you always know that was going to be your niche? No. Is that something you gravitated toward? Well, it's kind of what came to me. I don't know if you experienced this, but I seem to have pockets of people come to me at different times. Like every once in a while, I have pockets of people who love narcissists. Mm -hmm. And then every once in a while, I have pockets of clients who are therapists and coaches. Um, I've always, because I am a perfectionist, I've always drawn, just because of the wording on my website and how I present myself, maybe, I don't know, but I've always drawn perfectionists. And perfectionists are often high achieving, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're always... The, I love the servant's heart of I will leave this place better. The problem with perfectionism is, well, the benefit of perfectionism is it can be better. I know it can be better. I can mm-hmm. be better. It can be better. Mm-hmm. You can be better. We can all be better. Yay. <laughs> like that's the beauty of perfectionism. Mm-hmm. The downside is that if we are not already there, we beat ourselves up. Mm. I know this is how I should be, right? but I'm not. And then so we're unkind to ourselves because we aren't at our goal yet. Albert Ellis, right? What? Shooting our, Albert Ellis? Shooting on ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So can I share one of my favorite tools ever? Yes, please. Please do. I love this. If I talk to anybody for over five minutes, this comes out of my mouth, basically. So um, if I were queen of the world, I would ban should, must, have to, need, and for Midwesterners, gotta. Hmm. The reason I would ban them, even though we all use them to motivate ourselves and to make us better, is because they actually create stress and they mm-hmm. in they hinder our progress to where we want to go. So you want to do an experiment with me? Please. I love I playing. love I love <laughs> having people like try the tools and experience them because then we know if it works for us or not, right? Mm-hmm. Versus uh that won't work. Or, or so anyway, so thank you for experimenting. Oh yes. So what's something you, it's on your list, you have to do, your have to do list. Let me see. <laughs> right? <laughs> Let's list. see. Hmm. <laughs> so many things to choose from. All right. I have to reply to my new email subscribers because awesome. I like to say thank you. To great. Okay. Well, so thank. great. So say I have to, I have to reply to my new email subscribers. I have to reply to my new email subscribers. Close your eyes. And what's happening in your body? Well, I start stressing over when am I going to do it? Exactly. And where do you <laughs> I, feel I, the stress? I think of it as a large, like, lump sum because of all the people I have to do at once. And I'm thinking, yes. well, that's, that's going to take time. I mean, an hour to do that. I already have a full day. Do right? I do, do, I do that after my doing? kids come home? But then my, my, I know my kids are going to want time with me and I'm, I don't want to take away from family time. Do I do it in the evening? Well, I'm probably going to be tired by then. I've tried that before. That doesn't really work. That's why I have so many piled up. <laughs> right. So notice what you naturally did was, okay, I have to do this. But here are all the things that's a problem with that. Here are all the things that are getting mm-hmm. in my way, right? There's resistance to the idea. But it's on your list for a reason, right? I mean, you want to do it because it's a good idea, right? Okay, right. so... Say instead of should, must, have to, need, and you're more of a have to person, I have a, I have a feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, say either it'd be a good idea or it would be helpful. So say the same thing and choose one of those two. It would be a good idea. 
if I made time to reply to my email subscribers to say thank you. Great. What do you see? What do you feel now? What's happening in your body? Okay. Empowerment. What's empowerment feel like? Uh, freedom. Freedom. Right? Yeah. Freedom. Loose. See, it's the same yeah. thing. Loose. More yeah. relaxed. Less Not stress. Rigid. Less pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So while, <clears throat> while these things are good to be on our list, how we tell ourselves or talk to ourselves about the list really makes a difference. Like the, our brain, it's always assessing for how much energy we have for mm -hmm. any task. Unconsciously, our brain's like, do I have the, the energy for that? Mm -hmm. So when we have a task and we're like, oh God, it's gonna take an hour and then I got all these other things to do, we procrastinate because the brain's like, we don't have the energy for that. Keep it on the list mm -hmm. versus I feel kind of empowered there's more energy, there's more freedom, I'm more relaxed. Which task do you think you're more likely going to do? <laughs> like a child, the one that's not forced upon us. Exactly. <laughs> we have a choice, Always. right? I swear our egos are like two and three year olds, mm -hmm. right? So you're saying the same thing, but one is so much more stressful and energy sucking than the mm -hmm. other. So I, it's a super simple tool. I think it is an amazingly powerful one because how many have tos and to do lists do we all have? Right, exactly. We should turn them into I get tos, right? Or I yes. can. Right. I can. Yep, absolutely. I could. I can. Right. Which yeah, sounds I can very similar to I should, but has a whole different connotation, right? Exactly. <laughs> I can is empowering. It's more of the, you know, assertiveness. I'm capable. I can do this. I can do this. When yeah. I was creating my uh, online course, I was doing all sorts of new stuff. And as a perfectionist, you know, that just, drives me crazy because I can't do anything perfectly when it's mm -hmm. on there. So after each one and before each one, when I was working on a new segment or creating a video or writing it or whatever I was doing, I would go, I can do this. I, Jane, you can do this. You can. And then I would get up after working my certain amount of time and go, yay, I did it. Yay. And so I'd celebrate. And that literally creates neurochemicals in our brain. Um, and I'm blanking on the name, acetylcholine. Mm -hmm. Acetylcholine is produced by reward, punishment, or importance, mm. right? And acetylcholine helps wire in learning into our brain. So I can do this. This is important to me. Acetylcholine to help you do it. Mm. Yay, I did it. Acetylcholine. Or punishment. Oh, I saw, I didn't do it again. What's wrong with me? Wired in. Mm. So how we, how we are with our tasks, our to-dos, our whatever, really, like it has more power than we realize, just brain-wise, just neurochemical-wise. So either way, we're going to have an emotionally charged experience. Yes. yes. Right? And it's that emotional, I've heard that it's our emotional moments that really sear into our memory, right, that we associate with, it become our frame yes. of reference, right, for our future, even sense of adequacy, Right, yes. to accomplish things, right? right? Aversion versus taking things on. Yes. Yes. And one of my, I, I get I get high horses, everyone, or not high horses. Try the so, horses? I get so, soapboxes. I get oh, on soapbox, soapbox everyone. <laughs> and currently mine is, why, why did we make self-praise bad? Like self-celebration, self-acknowledgement has turned into, you can't, who do you think you are? You think you're better than everybody else. Mm -hmm. Versus self-praise and self-acknowledgement is simply like, I'm happy with myself. I'm happy with what I did. I'm happy with that aspect. I'm just happy with me. Like it has no comparison whatsoever. And now that we know it actually helps our brain, um, you know, wire in new habits, it's even more important to take back the, yay me, I did it. I can do this. I'm capable. I'm, I'm very proud. It's not perfect, but I'm proud that I did it. Right? Absolutely. I think it's, it's, it's yeah. I don't know about you, but in my experience, when I sometimes celebrate small wins, my, my mind immediately wants to compare it to all of the things that I haven't accomplished. Yes. And say, wait, 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 hold on. Like, yes, okay, so you got that done, but why are you celebrating? Like, you, you really want to do this over here. Like, big deal. You know, I get that from clients a lot too. When I when I celebrate yeah. them, and I'm trying to teach them this skill, right? <laughs> to celebrate their small wins, I'm guilty of this too, right? And but the objections, right? They're minimizing the negative filtering, right? 
Yep. The Teflon. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, one of my favorite things, and I'm glad you brought that up because uh, we talked about it earlier, um, is we are our brains are wired to be hard on ourselves and find the negative. Like they're literally wired to find what's bad, what's mm -hmm. wrong. Um, the negativity bias you talk about in your book, right? Yes, exactly. And it makes sense because back when we're on the savanna and life was a daily just trying to survive and not get eaten and make sure we have food, the people who survived were not the ones laying back on the rocks going, oh, the sun's so warm. It's awesome. What's that noise in the grass? I don't know. I don't care. I'm having a great time. <laughs> you know, you're chomped by a tiger, right? Right. It was the people who were like, what? What is that? What's wrong? What's up? Do we have enough food? We got, do you see that noise? Do you see those things out there? We got to be careful. You know, the, Sleep with the one people, eye open. <laughs> what? Sleeping with one eye open, right? Yes. Those are the people that lived in a very mm -hmm. dangerous environment. And we inherited their, their brains, their nervous mm -hmm. systems. We are the result of the people who worried. Right? The people who didn't worry died. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> Lot to be said so, for that. Right. So our brain is literally wired to look for the problems, look what's wrong, look what we need to fix. But the good news is, and you know this as a therapist and you teach your clients this as you're helping them celebrate, is while we're wired for that, we can practice the positive. We can practice the celebration. We can practice going, yeah, I see that negative. And let's take just a little time to feel how good it feels to accomplish this or to appreciate this about yourself or to receive my appreciation. We can, we can practice and wire in this new um, capability. It's very akin to gratitude, right? Yes. Gratitude is so powerful. So powerful. Because yeah. one, doesn't it feel awesome when you're grateful? Yes. It, cha it completely changes my train of thought. It's, it, it even sets my train of thought for the day. Right? Yes, it does. So do you have a gratitude practice? I do. I what do you do? do? What do you do? Generally speaking, first thing in the morning, I will have my coffee. I will go in the lawn, front lawn. I'll do some stretches. Oh. And I'll, as I'm stretching, I will start naming off the things I'm grateful for. And I find that if I spend just five minutes in the morning doing that, I start the day less stressed. And it gives me a buffer before the stress begins. <laughs> right? Right. And you're wiring your day you're wiring your brain to look for grat for what you're grateful for in the day. Mm -hmm. Like you're setting your day that I think anytime we practice gratitude is super powerful, but the morning and the evening are the most powerful times because in the morning, as you're doing beautifully, you're setting up your day of like, I've got a lot of good things in my life. Wow. And as stressors hit still, there's that undercurrent of, oh my God, a lot of good things in my life. Here's a stressor, but I remember how how wonderful things are. Not everything, of course. Yeah, you just gave me an epiphany. I'm like, why don't I have a third column on my to-do list of just <gasps> gratitude? How cool it would be just to list things you're grateful for next to the things you have to do. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> how powerful and would that be, brilliant. right? Yes, brilliant. Yeah. And then one of the things I love about that practice is, um, you know, the retriculator activating system is the kind of, I know just enough to be dangerous. So here's how I think of the retriculator activating system. It's kind of the unconscious process that searches the environment for to that mat for things that match our beliefs, right? So if we think the world is sucky and pe people and the world is out to get us, our brain is like, see, there's an example. See, there's an see that guy cut you off the of traffic. See, there's another example. See, she just frowned. See, there's an example. Mm -hmm. So we're unconsciously searching for data that matches our belief system. Negativity bias, right? Mm -hmm. But Evidence. if we do the gratitude, then our reticular activating system is like, right, got it. Oh, look at that nice person let you cut in front of them in line. That was so nice. Or, oh, she just smiled it. That's great. Like, we are searching for data that matches this but under, you know, unconscious belief that you set up for your gratitude with your gratitude practice. So gratitude is so powerful. It's a powerful tool. Absolutely. Yes. Super powerful. Tells our brain what to look for, what to focus on. Yes. Right. 
Yeah, and we we all have filters. Mm-hmm. You know, like you know that if if you work with couples, you they will talk about the same situation. You're like, were you in the same conversation? <laughs> right. Because you each took something very different from mm-hmm. it. This is you know our filters and how much they influence our world. But gratitude helps us shift our filter. That's right. That's right. Words of wisdom. And therapy helps us shift our, I mean, this is why we're therapists, right? That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. It's all about trying to gain insight. What's that saying? If you're so, if you're inside the box, you can't read the label. Right. <laughs> I've never heard that. I love that. <laughs> Objectivity. Right? Yeah. 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 Excellent. So we just help people get out of the box. That's right. Get out of our, our own perspective, box. right? Perspective. Uh-huh. Without judgment. Yeah. Yep. Without judgment. Oh, you just said a key word there. Can you imagine if we didn't all judge ourselves all the time, that negativity internal bias? Mm -hmm. How much? I I have one of my specialties is working with caregivers of people who have Alzheimer's. And there's no caregiver who ever comes to me and says, I'm doing such an amazing job. I am the best caregiver I can be. I am so happy with what I am giving. They all come like, why am I not better? Mm-hmm. I can't, I am so impatient. I, I don't take any time for myself. And I, cause I, all the doctor's appointments uh, and they all like so hard on themselves. And I'm like, Oh my God, you're like basically living for two people and you're hard on yourself. Look mm-hmm. at what you're doing. Mm-hmm. But once caregivers, you know, actually practice, take more time for themselves, be kinder, focus on what they are doing versus everything that they aren't doing. I'll tell you, Patrick, like not once in over 25 years have I ever had a a caregiver come and say, well, I'm a worse caregiver now that I take care of myself and I, you know, Mm. celebrate what I do well. (laughs) Like not one, like never once. I totally dropped the ball after I started, you know, taking care of myself and carving out personal time. (laughs) Right, right, right. Like nobody, they're all more patient. They're all more giving. They're all kinder. So our self- Kindness always spreads to outside of us. We didn't learn that. Right, right. So going back to that whole idea of filling up our cup first, right? Making yeah. sure that we felt we're, we're being tended to. Otherwise, we're at risk of things like burnout. Right? Care, we hear about caretaker burnout all the time or oh. burnout in general, right? Yes, right? Yeah. yeah. And anybody I, um, is at risk for that, anybody. Right? No matter how, you know, how capable you are at doing all the things, right? There's, yep. there's always the risk if we're not careful. And what's really interesting, and this is why I love high achievers, is the more capable we are, the more we tend to um, think we should be able to do it, even if we, if we, even if we are burning out. Right. Well, I can do that. I can. I'm totally I can I can just bring it back on. We can, you know, this is what we do. We constantly make stuff our responsibility because we can. But that's Mm -hmm. not always the right reason. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. Right. Or especially that is a good idea. (laughs) Right. Right. There you go. It's not always in our best interest. Right. Not always. Nope. Nope. Yeah. Sometimes it's a little blurry, that line, right? Takes sometimes. T- takes takes some time. <laughs> sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's very black and white, right? I don't know. It's it's more the older. I remember when I took my ethics class in grad school. I'm like, oh, this is gonna be so easy. Ethics are black and white, right? Mm-hmm. I came out of that class going, holy cow, <laughs> everything is blurry. Yeah. Right? So the boundaries, what's good for me and good for you. So it's it's I'm I think of boundaries almost like as a dance. Versus mm-hmm. a hard line. Mm-hmm. So there are some very hard line boundaries. You don't touch someone when they don't want you to. Like period, right? right? right. That's right. an easy one. And then there are all these, well, sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it's not okay. So it's it's a dance and it's a very clear communication with ourselves and with mm-hmm. whomever we're trying to figure out this boundary. Yeah, you definitely dance with ourselves too. Not just caretakers, people are responsible for other people, but even our own competing goals, right? Mm-hmm. You know, our value system and the things that we 
want to accomplish the things that we that are important to us. I don't know about you, but for me, oftentimes that's where I feel the, the tug of war is when I have yes. competing goals, you know, trying to buy for my time, um, different values, right? The intersection of family values, career values, self personal development, self care, um, right? Sleep, <laughs> sometimes getting this thing done, you know, um, both important, right? But sometimes it's like, mm, like you said, like I could, I could get this thing back on board if I just sacrifice two hours, you know, <laughs> two hours more of my time, you know. And, but there's a diminishing returns sometimes when we start, yeah. start, you know, start yeah. borrowing too much. And that's one of the things I like about getting older is. This is I'm a queen of reframes sometimes, and this is a major one. <laughs> I love this about getting aging. Um, right. Getting older. <laughs> Um, my body tells me much more quickly when I'm sacrificing too much. Hmm. I'm giving more than I really have to give. My body's like, stop now. Mm -hmm. I can't work late at night anymore. I used to be able to. I used to pull all-nighters. I could just work, you know, for 12 hours in a row. Now my body's like, oh, no. No, we will, <laughs> we will show you the toll of that now, not two weeks from now. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> So my body's really helped me with boundaries that work for me at, you know, at whatever age I'm at. Where before I just kind of overrode my body and I didn't care. Mm -hmm. Take a little more abuse, right? Yeah. <laughs> Have a little absolutely. bit of lag time before it catches up with you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like decades for some people. <laughs> right. That's the whole thing about burnout though, isn't it? Like it takes a lot more time to recuperate from burnout. Any time we might have gained pushing too hard. Any any gains we may have made are usually lost on the back end trying to oh recover. Oh, my goodness. Right. Yeah. When I created my program, I was burning the – I was working all weekend, 12-hour day, seeing clients and then working on the program, and it, like not really resting. And after I got it completed because I had a goal, right? mm -hmm. I had a deadline, and I did it, but at a high cost. And for two weeks after, I just basically – because he saw clients and, and slept because mm -hmm. I burned myself out too like i'd used up all my neural chemicals i, I was depleted mm -hmm. so i'm like wow that was don't do that again <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> okay that's a win but <laughs> it's a win yeah. but at a cost right <laughs> yes exactly and counting the cost is important doing things with intention on purpose for a purpose even if it is you know if we know what we're in for right sometimes yeah. we know it's like okay we have a deadline, but this is how this is what we're gonna do after, mm -hmm. right? To recuperate a little yes. respite, right? Recharge. Yep. Yeah. I don't know about you, but during the pandemic, you know, there was less of what naturally energizes and nourishes me available. Mm -hmm. So I had to figure out other things to do to to replenish me because I could feel the I've been in this business for a long time, but I've never burned out. Mm-hmm. And the pandemic, I'm like, oh, this, uh, this is different. Yeah, yeah, this is teetering on burnout here. So that mm -hmm. was a signal of more self, like find new creative ways to nourish yourself because I can't serve if I'm burned out. Mm -hmm. I can't. Like I can't have compassion for other people who, you know, have a problem that I think is minuscule compared to my burnout, right? Right. Like, I can't That's a bad, be there bad, for them. bad place to be in. Yeah. Exactly. Not a good therapy. No. No, oh, so that's always a signal. I remember um, I had a, a professor in grad school who said, if your clients' lives are more interesting to you than yours, get a life. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> right? And I'm like, right. the pandemic just showed me the brilliance of that remark. Mm. Oh, that's what she was talking about. Right here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, what are you doing? What are you guys doing? Anything fun? Right. <laughs> All right. Right. It's so important to have fun. So important to, but what's that saying? Variety is the spice of life, right? All the, I mean, the re, all the research I have looked at at what happiness is, is about two things really, right? Variety and a sense of mastery over something or creative outlet, right? Wow. I've, I've actually never read that. I love that. Yeah. And the variety can also be the newness. Like our brains need. Mm -hmm new they're they're built to learn and grow absolutely i think variety is what helps create that ever expansion 
Yeah. Not that life needs to be completely spontaneous, but I like the 10% rule, right? 10% of our schedule should be allocated to learning, doing new things, new exposure, new stimulus. Could even be driving home a different way from work, right? (laughs) Going on a walk down a different street. Yes, know, picking up a so different fun. book, listening to a different podcast, trying a different exercise routine, a little bit of variety, right? Yeah. But like a spice, you know, just just a pinch, you know, yeah. something different. I, yeah. I think you're right. It, it sparks, it sparks us. Mm-hmm. It sparks us. And that's part of the reason I love, and I'm sure you love this as a, you know, podcaster. Like I love being on podcasts and talking to people I've never talked to before. It is so exciting. After every podcast, I'm like, oh, this was awesome. And I've got so much yes. energy just from absolutely the right connection and so important. It's going back to what you're saying about the pandemic. That's that was actually my way of avoiding burnout. It was starting the podcast. That's when I started it. And yes. the video, the video podcast is I wanted to learn right. something new. You know, I got excited and I was, you know, diving into that world a little bit. And then I started I took some online courses around how how to you know, make everything work and the process and the mastery. systems and mm-hmm. mastery, right? But something scalable. So you're never quite, you, there is no, you know, mountaintop. There's always something new to learn. Yeah. I think that's very important. Have something scalable, right? Because yeah. um, it started off as a blog years ago with the idea that, oh, maybe I could, you know, share some information down the road, make a little money or something, pay student loans, whatever. And then it turned into the podcast (laughs) and then it turned into the YouTube channel over the pandemic. Right. That was one, that was like the creative outlet. And then the other part of it was connecting with nature. So my wife and I decided to make a butterfly garden to save the monarchs. And so we pulled up grass and started planting native milkweed and pollinator. And, you know, now when I look up my window, at any given day, I have butterflies of all sorts fluttering about because we have all the different host plants. It's a whole thing. Again, very scalable because there's so much to learn, host plants. And so I, you know, that's what I did to prevent burnout during the pandemic was those two creative outlets, right? right. On top, you know, I, you know, in addition to what, you know, other self-care, family, things are important, but obviously having a, something that was just mine, right? Yeah. Yeah. This and then something to share with the family. You know, we could do it together, right? And so I have my wife to thank for that. That was her. She took the lead on that, but it's been it's been right. fun to do together. You know, even uh, my my older daughter has created like a hub, and she's helping now spread to the community through Girl Scout Project and sharing um, the, <laughs> the the plants and you know giving them away the from what was was called a hub. You know, so basically growing the nectar plants, growing the milkweed giving it to the community and letting other people start butterfly gardens and stuff to save the monarchs. And it's really quite fun to see how it's grown, you know, all from an attempt to get ahead of burnout. I have tears in my eyes. Talk about making the world a better place. Yeah. Right from your little garden. Right. Right. It's really quite, quite, quite an honor to see how, how much she's taken to it. So, Yeah. It's yeah, fun. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I um the birds were my friends. Like I live in an apartment with a balcony. Mm-hmm. And I I actually have two balconies. And I would stand out on my balconies and just look at the birds. I'm like, the birds are like the birds are brilliant. And then I always plant stuff on my balconies that attract like pollinators and hummingbirds and stuff. And it's just it's just beautiful. And it feels good, so good to help nature in a very small way. Absolutely. You know, so much feels out yeah. of our control. Yes. I think animals are so, so nice to have something outside of ourselves that we care for and keep us grounded. It nature. Really yeah. It really is. I'm reading this book, Reclaiming Conversations by mm-hmm. Cheryl Turkle. Mm-hmm. It is so powerful, Patrick. I want to tell everybody about it. She's basically saying how that we spend so much time on our devices that we're losing empathy and we're Mm. losing the ability to be with ourselves without external stimulation. Mm -hmm. And both your podcasting and the butterfly garden and your stretching and your mantras and your coffee and your garden, they're all like, they're all ways of you being with yourself or connecting with another being Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things I thought was fascinating, and you know, thank God for therapists, is she said people are finding conversations awkward because you can't script them, you can't redo them, you can't make them perfect before you send them. Mm -hmm. So people are now thinking that they're bad conversations because we say stuff and go, oh, whoops, wish you wouldn't have said that, or mm -hmm. awkward pauses and like, oh, what's wrong? So we're losing the art of one being with ourselves, but two deeply connecting with another person. Right. Which historically from a tribal sense, you know, it should be our strength, right? You would think. Yeah. Um, and I think you're right. It's becoming a lost, a, a lost uh, aspect, you know, strength, right? Yeah. Or, because to a large degree, social media and I, you know, I think it is about how you use it, but I'm, I am seeing a lot of more young adults with social anxiety. Yeah. Who just are missing the, the, whatever you want to call it, emotional intelligence or, you know, the pragmatic skills. Right. And I, I would say it comes down to practice. Mm -hmm. Absolute because repetition. If, yeah. yeah. If we only see the perfectionism that is on social media mm -hmm. and then we're our messy selves and we're with another messy self person, we're like, what's wrong? What's mm -hmm. wrong with us? Why are we right. not perfect? Because that's our, mm -hmm. that's our, that's our box. Right. right? We already, I know we've seen that to some extent through the media, through magazines and comparative thinking, but yeah, social media is taking it to a whole other level. Whole other level. Yeah. 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 So it's, so I love the book and she's like, we don't have to get rid of devices, but let's also cultivate self-connection and other connection other deep mm -hmm. connection mm -hmm. so it's funny all... you you bring that up because when i'm when i'm working with clients i especially especially clients and i i i gravitate toward this population for sure because of the way i grew up but when i'm talking about social anxiety and socialization skills and i say one of the best things that ever happened to me was getting a job as a waiter in college because wow. that kind of throws you into an environment where you have that forced interaction with strangers and conversations and all the time and, but in, in micro doses, right? Different, whether you and I work graveyard and into the, the morning. So whether I'm dealing with drunk college students or I was dealing with, you know, grumpy construction workers in the morning or right. professors from the school <laughs> university across the street where I was attending, you know, it was a different personality type. Yes. And so you had to learn how to engage the different personality types. And so that's actually a homework assignment I give to my my young adults with social anxiety now who are terrified of work or have only ever worked in one very controlled kind of environment, retail or something like that. And I'm like, you know, I would really encourage you to try, you know, dipping your toe in the water as a host or hostess at a restaurant and then work your way into a waiter. That'll be the, the best training ground <laughs> in my in my experience for people's right. skills. Yeah. That's a great, and I because your money is dependent on it, right? Because <laughs> your tips, your tips right, are dependent it on it, right? There's a motivation. <laughs> it's true. It's true, and it's mastery, and I love the micro dose, and it's it's like an experiment. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's I worked food service all through college and grad school. It was that same thing. I wasn't a waiter. I I worked more in the like behind the line, mm -hmm. but it was still like. You know, Absolutely. interacting and figuring out and, how to, and you yeah. knew the difficult people and you'd figure out how to act with them. And mm -hmm. it was fascinating. That's yeah. a different kind of customer service. You know, you're not just on the phone. And there's a, there's the human, like you said, the, the human connection, the human connection, right? You're dealing with people in the flesh. It's a little bit different than making cold calls, you do a, you know, through a telemarketing company or something, you know, oh, or complaints all the time, right? I mean, you're, that's, you know, as a waiter, waitress, you'll have, conflict resolution you'll have complaints but that's not the bulk of it hopefully right. hopefully i know if it is oops right. Right. <laughs> um hopefully you're making you know people are happy with you and you find ways to have short conversations or sometimes people won't have longer conversations and talk about their day and it might be slow shift it might be a fast shift and you have to allocate your time it's all of those life skills you know oh that's um, such good training yeah. i never thought about it that way yeah Patrick, you have some very, very good ideas. <laughs> I think that should be mandatory, right? When you're 18, <laughs> you'll be a, a waiter for one year. 
<laughs> yeah, 16. Even better. National service of, of waiters. <laughs> <laughs> we'd all be we'd all be more socially adept people. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Save the world one waiter at a time. That's right. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh. So your um your book is out, right? Yes. A lot of these concepts that you know we're chewing on right now are are packaged neatly there for anyone that wants to take a gander. When I looked at the price on Amazon, I was like, wow, that is terribly affordable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Could have well, gone for because, the juggler, but you didn't. <laughs> well, I, I could have, yeah. Well, I made what was important to me because as a perfectionist and as a super busy person, short is helpful. Like if I have mm-hmm. to read a, a 500 page book, I mean, I will, but I'm like, oh, when am I going to do that? But my book is like less than 50 pages. Yes, I saw. Yeah. It's short and sweet and simple. And so people can actually, and they're all the, they're this, the stuff I use with my clients, the mm-hmm. bedrock principles that mm-hmm. I share with everybody I work with um, a lot at a lot cheaper rate. <laughs> yes, I was going to say. <laughs> Books are fantastic because you can boil still- down a decade of experience into a couple hours and boom. Like, yeah, fantastic. And I'm, I, I'm an audio learner, visual, so I, I'm a big fan of Audible, Kindle, or whatever, things that yeah. read to to me while I'm gardening or <laughs> a butterfly garden or something or at the gym. You know, some people listen to, to music I, at the gym. I'm, I'm an oddball. I listen to podcasts, you know, audio you're, books. You're a growth person, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Who's a That's therapist? That's fantastic. Right? <laughs> All right. And so um, where can our uh, listeners learn more about you your book uh well my book is uh, uh hold on let me, let me get it everything is perfect just not me a roadmap for self-acceptance it's on amazon for 4.99 Excellent. So it's super cheap uh quick read and um you can find me on my website is everydaylove.me uh-huh and on instagram i'm dr jane tornator i think hold on nice think this is your site right yes that's me Nice. I love yep. the cover of your book. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's super. I love it's bright and cheerful. And yeah. as you can tell from my sweater, I love orange. I say <laughs> it looks like the sunset, which is my favorite time of day, by the way, the golden hour. Absolutely. Love oh, it. dusk makes yeah. me so happy. Right? Things I don't do you experience this? For me, at dusk, things feel more possible. Yes. Absolutely. What is yes. it about that? I tell my my little one that uh that's when I give thanks is at sunset. Like when the golden hour, you know, if I can have five minutes to sit outside or in the car, wherever I am, just to kind of stare at the sunset for a minute, like does wonders yeah. for me. Yeah, me too. Yeah. It feels like things are more possible. Mm-hmm. It feels like the world's more magical. I love sunset. Yeah, absolutely. So excellent. Um, so you can find your book here on Amazon. All the links are here. I know you're on, you have uh, your socials, and I'll make sure to link all of that up in awesome. the show notes. Right? Awesome. Very good. Yeah, and that website's Doctor Jane Tornator. Doctor spelled out because there's a psychiatrist to someone in New York who has Dr. Tornator. Oh, okay. Retire so I can have Dr. <laughs> <laughs> oh, websites. Yes. Yeah, I gotta right. love them. <laughs> Snag those URLs while you can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's definitely. Oh, hello. Oh, the cat made an Your appearance. Your cat made an appearance. Yes. That's the one nice. thing I love about doing therapy at home is. Oh, right. People's pets and they get to see my pets. And I think my big I one's locked out of the room. Winnie. Winnie, Winnie. It's always nice to have furry friends. Oh, my goodness. Aren't you adorable? <laughs> this is the old lady. Yeah. Winter. Oh Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> what kind of dog? She's a Maltese Shih Tzu. Maltese. Oh, she's yeah. adorable. She's a, the epitome of a lap dog. You can tell she's Aww. pretty agreeable. That's great. Yeah, she's just sitting there going, I'm good. <laughs> I'll dance for you. <laughs> yeah, my cats would not be doing that. <laughs> yeah, no. My cat either. <laughs> but yes, there's a lot to be said for working from home. Mental health wise. Yeah. There really is. Yeah. And pet and pet happiness wise. I mean, there are a lot yes. of healthy, I don't happy know what they're pets gonna do as a result of the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if they ever have to go back to the way it was. 
<laughs> I know. I know. I would like to see people in person. We'll see. Maybe oh. a hybrid. Yes. Hybrid. And I think that's the way of the way of the future. Hybrid uh, therapy. I think options are always nice too for clients. A lot more flexibility there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I honestly, my clients, most of my clients are happier online because they can just hop on and then go off to the next. Don't worry about commute, lost time commuting. And for the ones that want the face to face, you know, having the option. But I think most people these days are, have learned the value of tele, tele, teletherapy. And, yeah. Thank yeah. goodness. Thank yeah. goodness, man. I was a little, it was like panicked when it came on. Oh no, what are we going to do? <laughs> 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 yeah yeah it's funny how things change isn't it yeah. so and we're adaptable you know that's absolutely humans yeah. are adaptable and to pull that capability and like i can do this and i think you know how the the greatest generation was called the greatest because they went through hell basically they went through mm -hmm. world war ii right mm -hmm. they figured out how to survive how to make do how to completely you know figure out everything and so there's this basic strength to that generation of like, you know, if it needs to be done, we'll do it. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping way. that we do the same thing with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. that I can survive that. I can survive this. Yeah. But I, I hope it gives us that same grounding. of. I think it will. I'm getting that. I'm getting that sense that in, in history, as we look back at this time, it's going to be seen as a time of, um, you know, invention, innovation, right? right? The rise above and, and in spite of all the loss like these things bring but with it a lot of uh generativity as well yeah yeah, yeah. that's true there are a lot of it there's a lot of online stuff that was never there Not, before yeah so. even zoom right what i'm using right now I had to step up you know right? and and in terms of the offerings and security and all that stuff right yeah so, yeah so Excellent. good i i hope that is true yeah that we come out of this as better people Yes, I have faith. World. <laughs> Let's go for it. Yes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Therapists, we're doing our part. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, we certainly haven't seen any shortage in mental health need. So, yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, you said it'd be great if we could work ourselves out of a job someday. It would be. Yeah. And then we'd figure out something else to do. You'd be the butterfly <laughs> propagator. Right? right? <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. There's always something to do. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, doctor, for joining us and, and sharing all of this. It's been a fun, fun conversation. And I hope to have you back on down the road if you're game. Thank you. so. Absolutely. I would love that. Thank you all so right. much. My pleasure. You enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. You too. Bye. All right. Thank you. Hey, if you're getting value from this content and you haven't done so already, be sure to like and subscribe and sign up for the MHT newsletter. That way you don't miss out on any new content as it's released. And if you happen to be listening in on Apple Podcasts, please do me a favor and leave a review. It'll do a lot for reaching more people and raising mental health awareness. All right, well, there you have it. Another tool to help you thrive. Until next time, make good things happen and share with friends and family. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>